on your screen. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Mr. Jacob Brillhart and his new book, Voyage Le Corbusier, Drawing on the Road. And here to introduce Mr. Brillhart, we have a colleague of his from the University of Miami School of Architecture. Please welcome to the podium, Professor Rocco Cheo. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here to introduce uh, a colleague of mine from the School of Architecture, but it's also wonderful because it's a colleague who also draws and is an architect and uh, shares a lot uh, in common in terms of our way of thinking about architecture, about the value of drawing, and about education in general. So I was really delighted when, when Jake asked me to introduce him, and I'll keep the the introduction short, um, but I do want to relay one interesting conversation I had probably a month ago in which uh, I was having dinner with a group of people and one was a reporter from the Herald and they said, you know, who's the, who's the hot new architect now in Miami these days? You know, I mean, you're an architect, tell me who's the hot architect. And uh, I had to say, nobody had asked me that question ever. <laughs> and. Um, and, but the first person that came to mind, of course, was Jake, because um, Jake is a hot architect, uh, not just because he's written this great book, um, but because his practices, uh, which he started recently, uh, I should say, in, well, not that recently now, 2007, is it, uh, with uh, his wife, Melissa Harrison, um, is, is doing just wonderful things. They, they have... Uh, um, been invited to the MoMA PS1 um, Young Architects program um, and exhibited their work in New York. Of course, their work has been featured in the New York Times, in Metropolis Magazine, uh, Wallpaper Magazine. They've won numerous uh, awards from the American Institute of Architects. Um, and they've built this incredible house, their own house, with their own hands um, in the Spring Garden area of Miami. And it's just, um, I in a way, it sort of puts into uh, built form everything that sort of Jake does, which is he designs, he draws, he thinks about architecture, and they, they, they uh, Melissa and Jake have just made this amazing project. Um, but we're here to talk about his new book, and that is uh, Voyage Le Cobusier. And um, Jake is, uh, of course, um, a well-trained architect. He, he was in school at Tulane and Columbia University. Um, and he's traveled extensively and drawn himself, and I think that's one of the reasons why this book sort of came about. Um, it was, in a way, a way of him connecting what he does um, to a larger uh, academic subject, in this case, uh, the drawings uh, of Le Corbusier, who he talks about, of course, in his book um, as Charles Edouard Genre, um, given that he used that name um, until uh, just before he became Lake of UCA in 1920. So the book is about Genere's travels between 1902 and 1911. And just to give you a, 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 a quick impression of what was happening in 1902, uh, J.M. Bacon became the first man to cross the Irish Channel in a balloon. Hilaire Belloc writes an incredible book called The Path to Rome, which is literally hiking from uh, Eastern France to, to Rome, and it's an incredible journey about uh, his experiences in traveling to Rome. And Enrico Caruso makes his first phonograph recording of his voice. And so what these things have in common, I think, are that they're all records of experiences that happen in 1902 in an interesting time. And, and Jean Array is part of that experience. He's a person who uh, is suddenly, um, engaging architecture and finding the world of architecture through his travel drawings and through his sketches. And that's what I think uh, places the book in an interesting way because it's 1902 and the world is changing in terms of what's being discovered. By the end of that journey in 1911, uh, things have changed dramatically. People are looking at the world in a very small way. Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealand board physicist, formulates the first theory of the atomic atom or the, the atomic structure of an atom. Carl Jung starts to look inward with his theory of psychoanalysis. And um, Ruald uh, 
Edmondson reaches the South Pole. So suddenly, the world is very different um, just uh, a few years later. So that's the context within this book uh, is written. I think it's an absolutely wonderful book, and um, I think Jake has done a phenomenal job of really um, making a book that's an inspirational, really an inspirational companion for the observant, the imaginative, or anyone who just wants to wander and see things the way that Jean Array discovered uh, the world in the early 20th century. So please make welcome Jake Brillhart. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jake. Um, thanks, Rocco, for that nice introduction. Um, and Victor, in Books and Books, thank you um, for having me and for everyone else for coming out. Um, rather than going through the chapters of the book tonight, I'm going to give you a little bit more of the backstory um, of how the book came about. Um, you'll have to bear with me. It's a, it's a little bit um, biographical in the beginning, but I think you'll kind of get the gist of it. Um, the project has been kind of a personal journey and a way for me to share why I think drawing remains relevant in the digital age, not only for students and architects, but for anyone who loves drawing in the creative search. Um, people always ask me, you know, where did you pick up drawing? And, uh, and where did the interest come from? And it's easy, it's my mother. She, uh, she published five or six children's books while I was growing up. Um, she did all the drawings and, and by hand and illustrated them um, in watercolor. And here are a couple of the book covers. The Dino Expert in Molly Rides the School Bus. Um, there's many more, but they're great little books, though, and they're beautifully drawn. Um, another person to mention is my sister. She's also a big influence. She's a painter here in Miami, and her work is very architectural in nature. And, um, sorry. and um, she's really interested in composition and form, and she studies the city um, that we live in. Melissa, maybe that'll be better. Um, and I'd say the third person that really um, um, played a role as Errol Barron, um, an architect and my professor at Tulane. Um, I was in his class and we used to look at his sketchbooks. And as you can see, he could make really incredible drawings. Um, here's one he did of Chateau Chenois in France. Maybe that's not going to work either. All right, I'll just have to man up and do it. Um, here are two others by Errol. You can see um, Campo San Giovanni in, in Venice and La Tourette by Corbu. But when I was looking at these in college, I was so amazed by the fact that he could draw both traditional architecture and mo modern architecture or contemporary architecture with a watercolor medium that people always associated with, with this kind of um, old-fashioned stigma. Um, after working with Errol, I went to Columbia Grad School, and the old way of doing architecture had completely changed. Um, it was the end of the Bernard Schumi time at, at Columbia, and Mark Wigley was stepping into place. Um, new software technologies such as Maya and Max were coming into practice, and we didn't do any hand drawing. Um, instead, we were making all of these di digital generated analytical drawings, which look like this. Um, the drawings turned into computer models um, that started to depict space, circulation, structural organization, and were all very conceptual. Um, simultaneously, we were moving in and out of the paperless studio um, and rarely even printing anything, if you can imagine, and mainly projecting things on the walls. It was all um, exciting and I really enjoyed it. But um, after having graduated, it still kind of haunted me that I didn't really feel like I knew how to draw in the traditional sense. Um, meaning where you can pick up your sketchbook and go out into the city and draw a picture of a building and people would know what it is that you drew. <laughs> I thought that was a problem. So I decided to take a trip to Europe and discover this, what I call the practice of drawing on the road. In essence, it was kind of a slow grand tour. Um, no one else seemed to be interested in it at the time. Most of my friends were anxious to get jobs at top design firms in the city. And I felt sort of ridiculous, actually, having just learned all this incredible software using parametrics, laser cutters, digital modeling, 
and thought maybe this kind of trip was a bit romantic and old-fashioned. But I said, what the heck, I'm going to do it. Um, for inspiration, I started looking at Korb's sketchbooks. Um, I had always been interested in his paintings and drawings. Um, his architectural education was mostly self-taught, um, as much of it was learned through travel drawing. Um, which is in the book, and predominantly done between 1907 and, and, and 1911, where he took a number of trips throughout Europe. Um, here you can see the routes. Um, this is how I sort of organized the book. Um, his time in Le Chaux de Fonds, then a, a short Italy trip. He, he lived and traveled throughout Europe for some time, um, then through Germany, and then his more well-known trip, the um, journey to the east. So what I decided is to gather up all these sketchbooks and the itineraries, maps, and writings and use these as my actual travel guides. On my first trip, I essentially followed Corb's route back in exactly 1907 as he traveled through Italy at the age of 19. I made a few detours to Rome and to Pompeii, which Corb later visited in 1911, but essentially my goal was to make drawings from the same places Corb stood 90 years ago. The only problem was, is there's no single book at the time of his early and late watercolor drawings. So I was toting around five or six books to learn from in order to teach myself how to do this. Um, I was also carrying around photocopies of Winslow Homer's drawings and a lot of Errol's sketches um, because they were so excellent at this idea of um, composition, watercolor wash, and technique. So here is a few photos of my first trip. <laughs> I committed to making two or three drawings a day. Um, I probably made about 65 drawings on the trip, um, drawing on site and painting the picture at the same time. So I didn't, I didn't paint later. Um, and now I'll show a few drawings where it's fun that in these kinds of presentations you can actually put your drawings next to a legends. Um, mine will be on the right and Corb's will be on the left. Um, these sketches were done in Alberti, um, were done in Alberti Santa Maria Novea in Florence. You can see Corb's exterior wall tombs in 1907 on the left and my watercolor study of the elevation on the right. Um, sometimes I would use Corb's photographs as a point of reference. The, um, this photo, and I was carrying around other books, this one's towards the new architecture. Corb also remarked that you know this is one of the finest spaces due to its kind of clean unadorned interiors. Here's another photo of his, um, the Pyramid of Sestius in Rome. And amazingly enough, when tracking him, some of the city has changed dramatically and some of it is much the same. Um, here's uh, some drawings of Pompeii. Um, if you look on the left, down bottom, you can see the um, Corb's drawing of the Temple of Jupiter. And um, first he does a really quick vignette more time in pencil and, um, and draws what he actually sees. Um, and then the third, the, the last drawing, the top one, he actually inhabits the Temple of Jupiter and redesigns what it once was by redrawing the columns and looking out into the form space. Um, this is pretty remarkable for a 19-year-old that hasn't been trained as an architect to go out there envision what, what it once was, and then draw it fairly accurately. And it's, this is the time when he really, um, and other historians have said this, is when he started to take drawing and turn it into design, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, I didn't always draw um, the exact same perspective. My drawing's on the right and Corb's are on the left. Um, but would explore the same building and try to take away what Corb felt was important, and also what was important to me and what was happening in the present day. Um, you know, for example, here I was paying more attention to the architectural details, but also to color, sh shadow, light, and composition. Shortly after this trip, um, I began teaching at, at the University of Miami, thanks to many of my friends here tonight. Um, and this is a picture of the studio we had in Rome um, a few years back. And I have all the students put all their drawings on the wall. Um, in an effort to teach the students, I found myself showing them exactly what I'd been showing myself. All these drawings of Corbusier, as well as 
Winslow Homer's drawings and my, my buddy Errol's. And I was also using Tom Spain's book. Um, and since then, you know, this teaching trip has, these teaching trips to, to um, Rome have really allowed me to continue to track Corbu um, and kind of go out on different stints. Um, so it's been great. And at this point, I've, I've amassed hundreds of these drawings which I won't bore you with all night, but we'll get to his. But um, you can see two more here. His is on the left. Um, these are in Istanbul, which um, Corb made in 1911 on his journey to the east, um, which eventually is really his capstone of his architectural education. But uh, notably, I had wisened up at this time, and ragging, rather than lugging around every book on Corb, I started making Xerox copies of his drawings and inserting them into my sketchbook and leaving a blank page for me to draw. So I was, um, here is Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Um, here are a couple more of Corb's drawings on the left of the Solomon Mosque, and mine are on the right, again, in Istanbul. Um, I even went to Tokyo, which Corb um, didn't visit until much later um, as a designer and a practicing architect, but um, his his sketchbooks and his drawing documentation is so well done that you can kind of go to any city you want in the world and have your own little travel guide. Um, and it still proves for me to be kind of insightful and meaningful. Um, so I took his Tokyo sketchbooks not too long ago. and, and But now you can go and draw his own buildings. This is the uh, Tokyo's National Western, Tokyo's National Museum of Western Art that he designed in 1959. And um, those are his conceptual notes at the top, and that is my drawing of his building later on. So to see what he analyzed and then reinterpret it and see his design is, is um, it's kind of fun. But one of the most important trips was to Greece. Um, my old teacher, Errol, happened to be there at the time working on a private project. And um, we met up for a day of drawing at the Acropolis. And Errol shared with me a quote that really allowed me to what I say to see more. Um, he said, a drawing needs to be going someplace. It should have a direction. Like classical music, it builds up, then settles down, and then revisits itself again. Musical notes have variety and a slight variation in them. So does a good drawing. Stop finishing all your drawings, Jake. Hearing this forced me to ask the question, what are my drawings trying to do? And that one needs to edit and have a point of view, and that you can't really just draw everything. Um, I'll come back to this idea, but I think it will make some sense in a minute. So, in the midst of all of these draw all of these sort of revelations and drawing trips, Yale comes out with a symposium entitled "Is Drawing Dead," which is which is about the crisis of drawing and its place in architecture. As the promise of digital technology was becoming increasingly fulfilled by parametric modeling, computational design, digital design, fabrication, hand drawing had come under some stress and was becoming old fashioned and some thought to be a waste of time. I had been grappling with this question for a little while. I did my graduate work in the 90s and um, my I mean, my undergrad work in the 90s and my graduate studies in the 2000s. And I realized I belonged to a, a different group of architects, um, the ones that were trained both in the analog and digital worlds um, at separate times. And these two drastically different teaching environments, one at Tulane, where we drafted by hand with rulers and pens and pencils and erasers, and the other one at Columbia, where we drew by clicking a mouse. Having experienced the benefits and difficulties of both, I feel I could compare the tools, these tools, with some level of credibility. So I started thinking about how architecture was advancing because of new digital technologies, and also what was being lost in the absence of hand drawing. And worked out a lot of these observations in a paper that I wrote called Drawing Towards a More Creative Architecture. For those of you who know of Corbu, that title is pretty close. Um, ultimately, I argued that digital and analog design tools, computer modeling, CAD, hand drawing, and physical mockups, are equally important. But the key is to understand 
when each tool should be used during the design process. I base the argument on neuroscience, my own observations from teaching students for the past seven years, and examples of the work from architects who deployed both hand drawing and digital tools in their projects, all to stress why drawing remained critically important. I'm not going to get into the, the paper because that's not what we're here to discuss, but it relates to the sort of idea behind the book, and that is that there's these unintentional digital casualties in regards to computer drawing. Um, the first one is that computer drawing is still a two-phase process, meaning that it's not a fluid operation, it's not a continuous process, and then when you're making the drawing and when you're printing the drawing, it's a, it's a sort of bifurcated deal, which is much different than what I call real-time printing, which is hand drawing. Um, the second thing is, is the leveling effect, leveling effect of the plotter. Um, this idea is that, you know, if all the drawings are delineated by the same hand, the plotter, um, there's going to be less variation in the work. The third is when a drawing, when drawing in the computer, one draws at a one-to-one -one scale, which is the exact scale um, of what the thing is. And, but when, when you draw by hand, you draw to a scale, and that scale is always in relationship usually to the human body or the size of your desk or something that you actually know and understand, the computer divorces us from this understanding. And the fourth um, was this sort of lack of understanding in technical drawing. And now with menu bars and Revit and all of these things, we can shop for a couch and we can put in a wall section. And, and this idea of drawing things that we don't even know what we're really drawing is really happening. Um, and that's not to say I'm here to destroy the machine. I love the machine and we use it every day. But there is some consequences to it. And interestingly enough, at the same time, Mark Tribe came out with a book um, called Drawing Thinking, Confronting the Electronic Age. And in, in it was an essay by Harley Jessup um, stating that Pixar usually draws a half a million hand sketches to put a film together. However, one time to save money, they didn't do this. They said, well, you don't need to do that. And in the pre-screening, it was a complete flop. And <clears throat> and the fact that the animations were flat, the characters didn't have any life, and there was no real personality development. Um, so to turn the film around, they went back and did over 200,000 hand drawings, and the story emerged. Um, and, and, and this is really proof to Pixar, the kind of digital software giant that can do anything in the computer. You know, Harley Jessup now says, you have to draw. Um, they even have figural drawing at lunchtime for the animators at Pixar. So if these guys are saying you should be drawing, I think we need to listen. Um, amidst all this discussion, Yale came out with the 41st edition of Perspecta to talk about travel drawing, using the Grand Tour as a model for understanding history, its current incarnation, and the future of architectural travel. Um, the most interesting takeaways from the journal were four questions. Where do we go? How do we record what we see? What do we bring back? And how does this change us? So with that, um, the, the book was really a culmination of all of these forces and ideas and texts and conferences, papers. And that's really the backstory of where the book came from. And at that point, I was convinced that others would like to learn and to see and to learn how to draw through Corbu's journey, as I sort of did. Um, and that's when I contacted Norton and said, I have an idea for this book. Um, on one hand, I knew from my past years of travel that there was no compendium of his watercolors in an easy-to-carry format like this. And there, some of these drawings had been published in other places, but they weren't done in a sort of large-scale, vibrant kind of color Xerox that you could actually really enjoy. So that's where the sort of the book was really born. Um, secondly, having studied these drawings so intensely over the past years, they taught me that we can do something the computer will never be able to do, and that is draw what we see. Um, I also began to see how Corb used his drawings at a, as a method of research and how his drawing process evolved over time from his early years of beautiful watercolors 
to analytical sketches and to shorthand visual note taking. But what these drawings also show time and again is his gigantic appetite for travel and visual exploration, looking and drawing to see, to understand in order to know. He didn't go out and see the world like your typical architect just drawing buildings. He drew landscapes, flora, fauna, people, objects, art, patterns, furniture. I mean, the list is, goes on forever. Um, here you can see just four objects, cityscapes, details, people. And to study these subjects, his process or method of drawing evolved over time, which is very evident in the book. Um, one can see he started out on the left-hand side making more or less representational drawings, which you can see of a, of a um, pasture and a farm, built farm barn in, in Switzerland. And then the drawings became more abstract and analytical as you move left to right. You can see the sort of representation drawing in the middle that's sort of abstracted. Um, and then they became even more abstract um, eventually as his drawing skills amazingly improved, his drawings became, I would think many people would say, less beautiful. Um, as you can see in the right, in the last drawing on the right, which is Piazza Navona, which is really a diagram of how the space works. So those four categories um, are really, you, when, you, when you flip through the chapters of the book, you really sort of understand how this evolution took place. But once he chose one of those methods, am I going the wrong way? Once he chose those methods, he then had to select a convention, and be it plan, sections, elevations, to better understand his, the, the things he was drawing. He also drew axonometric projections, street projections, aerial views. I mean, it's tons. But what's important to realize here is that he knew what drawing type to make to convey the best idea of what he was drawing. The idea behind what he was drawing, he knew the convention type. For example, if you see the, the window in elevation here, he knew that the elevation was critical to draw, and then he draws a little sectional study through it to show the depth of the profile of the window. So the fact that he drew a section and elevation is different than drawing a plan of these things. So he knew this from, without even any formal training, it's kind of amazing. Um, lastly, um, I look at, at in depth, the, the techniques he used were varied. He used pencil, watercolor, gouache, ink, colored pencil. And he also drew on loose sheets of paper as well as sketchbooks. And at one point he was even drawing on postcards. Um, as he developed between the ages of 14 and 25, you can see how his interest in subject matter would change over time, how his drawing techniques evolved. The book chronicles this drawing development as he moves from place to place. Starting from his second years at La Chaux de Fonds, he was primarily, primarily interested in the landscapes and making very realistic representational drawings. As he left for the nine month trip to Italy, he was focused on building facades and details making very time-consuming watercolor drawings. As he moved to Paris and Germany, he started to zoom out, now focusing on urban space, and his drawings became less accurate over time. He drew a lot of maps and took a lot of notes. By the time he reached Istanbul in 1911, he was making very diagrammatic drawings and notes and looking at overall form, the city as a whole, and the cultural details of place. But when you really dig deeper, you can see the complexity of Korb's creative search. Even as his interests and techniques evolved, he would continually weave together different subject matter with different media at different times, inevitably to see in new ways. This slide is a new drawing we have made in the office, and it's not in the book. But what it's attempting to do is further analyze graphically what he was choosing to draw, how he captured his subject matter, and what he was getting out of each drawing. Many folks casually say, Sunday morning watercolor drawings in the city are just pretty pictures. I would argue that there's a lot more happening here. Um, on the, so if you, if you can, I don't know. In essence, this is those four questions. Where do you go? 
What do you draw? How do you draw it? And what do you get out of it? Back from that book from Yale. And these are just 22 places he went, the show to France, Europe. Then it leads to the actual subject matter, which is taught people, places, um, buildings, elevations. The range is huge. Then it's the four types of representation that I talked about in terms of drawing with a level of abstraction, drawing in situ of making a representational drawing, the kind of diagrammatic drawing. Then he needs to decide on if he's going to draw it in plan, in section, in elevation. And then finally he says, well, I'm going to do it in pencil, I'm going to do it in gouache, I'm going to do it in watercolor. And then the most important thing, and I wish you could read these, but that's my fault, is the persistencies in architecture. And, and Peter Eisenman describes them as the things in architecture that don't change. Their mass, form, color, light, structure. They're these things that don't have anything to do with traditional architecture, or they have everything to do with it, and they have everything to do with modern architecture. These are the kind of fundamental, global things that are latent in great works. So I'm trying to put together a matrix of all of his places he went, the things he studied, and how this complete interweaving or complex web of decision making goes into making a drawing. Um, it's a little bit chaotic. And, um, let me, let me give you one example, um, and I wish you could see it, but, but bear with me. Um, this is the Siena Cathedral, it's an elevation of the Siena Cathedral. And, and from there he chooses to study, in this, in this line, he chooses to study architectural details and components of the building, as well as proportion and composition. So then it bifurcates to those two things. Um, then he needs to say, well, how am I going to draw this? And he chooses to draw it in represent representational drawing and analytical drawing. So it goes to these. And then from there, he decides he's going to do those types of drawings through elevations and elevational perspectives. And he's going to use ink and watercolor. So the fallout is, or what he really learns from what he's drawing, thus what leading one to better understand color, form, solid and void relationships, composition and pattern. So I've devised a series of, of kind of things that are always existing in architecture that I think have stood the test of time and how he gets to those through different subjects, through different places. And it's constantly <coughs> changing with different media. And when you realize how this is all working, you kind of can't believe someone at the age of 19 was weaving all this together. Um, I'm not going to bring you through these two because they're harder to do. Um, it's kind of hard for you to understand, but the second picture is a portrait done in 1909. He chose people as his form of study, representational drawing um, as the method, perspective as the convention, and carried it out with pencil and gouache, but it led to a better understanding of figural form and culture. So he's getting to these persistencies that are so important that I would argue don't change. So to conclude, whether you're Corbusier, and at the time, Genrette, working in the swells of the Industrial Revolution, or a global architect working with cutting edge computer software technology in the 21st century, or just simply interested in the creative search, there will always be immeasurable value in making travel drawings. In the authentic and active experience of drawing, of physically recording what we see, we bring back with us a new way of seeing. We bring back sketchbooks full of information, analysis, and an understanding of cultures. History and places, emotions, memories, sounds, and all the other elements that make what we see matter. Thanks. It's, it's really interesting to see the diagrams in the end because mm -hmm. I think the, the point that you bring up that Le, Le Cabusier is, is self-taught right. um, in a way that kind of is a diagram of his education. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be interesting to find out just exactly how many, I mean, it sounds very technical, but to go into how many hours were actually put into the work, if there's a way of estimating that. 
And the reason I say that is because Richard Sennett believes that in the book The Craftsman, he says that you know to really learn the craft of anything, it takes 10,000 hours. And he breaks it down to a number of hours per week and a number of years that anybody can be great at anything if they do it for that period of time. And it would be interesting to know in Le Cabusier's case, since that is in a way his education as an architect, what what occurred mm -hmm. there. And so do you have any like idea about You know, I don't have any idea on the time. He drew but or? you know, when I was looking at the drawings, um, I had to go to the found the Fondation and look at them and some of them are on loose sheets of paper, some of them are in sketchbooks. Um, and I didn't look and, and think of that, but there are notes and letters in about how long he did spend. In the Italy trip, he spent probably two hours on those beautiful watercolor drawings that have all the line work. Um, so you could, I mean, if you, you could make a stab at it. I mean, it would be interesting to do. You could, I could think about, I think he's way over 10,000 hours, though. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's an interesting, that, 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 that last matrix is, is, I mean, it's really just something, I, you know, there's so many drawings we didn't even put in the book. And, and there's so much happening with him that you kind of can't even believe. And, and that, in a sense, I'm just still trying to make sense of it um, because and the only way I can do it is through drawing. And the, and the funny thing was is we were making these drawings in the office the other day, and we were using plugins for Rhino to make the connections through all of the drawings. So there we were using the new technology to analyze the old, the old ideas. Um, I think there's more work to be done on all of that. But, but you see, even if you know, getting to the next line would be the projects that then you, mm -hmm. see, you see the direct connection between his sketches in certain sites in Rome and places right. like that in the baths and the projects that he does later on after that. I mean, it's, it's almost one-to-one -one the way he picks yeah. out certain forms. It's really incredible. Absolutely. In the, in the early houses he was, he was doing with um, La Platine in Switzerland in the beginning, when there's drawings of salamanders that you'll see in the book, that then you can actually see a salamander door handle on the actual mm -hmm. villa. I mean, there's, there's really literally direct connections. And some of the, the, the critiques I've gotten about the book online and in other places is, is you got to show exactly what you're saying. How does this relate to design? Um, and this was a question that we had with the editor. And she said, well, how, do you have like three more years? And you know, I said, no, we got to get this thing out now. But that, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is another great way of looking at it. Yes. I'm just curious of your opinion. Don't you think that you have to have an innate talent? I mean, born with the talent to be an architect, a designer. I mean, anybody can go to school to study it, but you just have to. You have to have that in your gut. You just have to have that eye. I think there's. I think there's. There's something to that. I. I, I agree. I think that. But. But I do believe in. And I didn't talk about it tonight. It was actually in more of my biographical stuff. But I didn't want that there's a book written by Betty Edwards called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain that is part of my, was part of my research. And she was a, um, an academic and, and, and she worked, she was a sociologist, I think, in, at, at UC Berkeley. And what she realizes is that she basically proved that anyone can learn how to draw. And, and that's the book that I also used in the exercises in her book basically break it down and, and it talks about the right brain and the left brain and that the right brain sees things more conceptually and the left brain thinks things, sees things more language based and more numerical. So like when you're working on the computer, you're using your left brain, which is letters, numbers, digits, all of these things. When you're, when you're, when you're drawing something out and reflecting on it, you're more in the right brain. So she, now, nowadays, and that book was written in I think 79, neuroscience and technology is actually, you know, advanced. But they're still finding truth to these sort of to this sort of reasoning and their exercises really do work. Now, I think you're probably right. To be an exceptional designer, there's something hard I understand what you're saying about drawing, but to, to practice and be successful as a designer or architect, I I believe that you have to have a innate talent and, and a passion. Yeah, I think you're probably right. 
But I think, it, but but it's amazing when we when we when I've done these drawing exercises with the, with our students at school in Italy, um, we're drawing negative space. We're doing all of these very basic exercises, and the students leave more or less not some of them not knowing how to draw, and they leave and really no, and and have a good handle on it. But that's more like you said a drawing thing and not a design thing. But I think once you get a handle on how you can, if you can draw. You're That's one true. step closer to being a good designer. You know, my friend always told me, if you don't know how to draw, you'll spend the rest of your life drawing other people's ideas, right? So the first step in being a designer is to know how to draw, because then you can actually express your idea the visually. Other thing I, I've learned is that, I don't know if anybody else knows this, but someone should, that d architect and design needs to have more of a marriage people like architects design a building and designers get the plans and it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. work. And that I believe that you should design, especially hotels and commercial, from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And if someone smart could actually realize that, it could change a lot of things. I've, re, I've read my architecture and I've redesigned, I've designed a building here mm -hmm. in Miami from the inside out. Didn't get credit for it, but designed it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. and it. it was very successful. No, no, I, I don't doubt it. Yeah. I, I, I think, I find this fascinating. I went to Yale. I, uh, I agree with the young lady about talent. Mm -hmm. My mother was an artist. She was a, the first Cuban um, a woman to do abstract sculpture. And she's in the Cuban Encyclopedia. Her name's Lucia Alvarez. And I founded Architectonica. I was the founder. And then I got four partners. So I think I know a little bit about some of this. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was born with the ability to draw. Nobody had to teach me. But my mother would try to tell me, oh, why don't you try this? I would say, and I was knee high to a grasshopper, I would say, don't mess with my stuff. <laughs> and I was a little kid. So some people have it mm -hmm. genetically. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to thank my mom. You know, I can't claim credit. Yeah, I went to Yale. I, you know, I got that math. That's my credit. But the, the whatever, let's call it talent, the ability to draw and to think spatially, I got it from her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did. You know, I didn't sell it at the, at the candy store next door. The, no school where I have ever been, ha, you know, has been able to give you that unless you have. But they can do what we all do. And, and here's what I really want to get to, is we can, we can undergo training or we can train ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that imp implies learning, not just learning from Las Vegas, but as Venturi used to say, but learning from everything and everybody around us that we can learn from. And I want to just mention, and I don't want to take up your, your no, no, no. this is your show, but, I have a master's from Yale in theory of design. And, and I went back to anthropology and philosophy. And I went back to, you know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. He said that in 1641. Well, 600 years before Christ, uh, Parmenides said, and Plato and Socrates recorded it, you know, the same is thinking as being. Now. If the same equation, maybe in one you have x's and y's, and in the other one you have m's and n's, and, and so on, it's the same equation. The human being has to think and thinks because he is or she is. I, I can't forget my mom. I'm sorry. I have a big, a wonderful thing about, about the female part of this. I, I you know, Philosophy will tell us that and demonstrate it. And one of the best examples I've ever known, and, and uh, Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Ms. Van der Rohe were the greatest architects when I was growing up, and wh mm -hmm. whom everybody- They were all designers, too. They all did furniture as well. They were all <laughs> designers. But, but even before that, they were thinkers. Mm -hmm. Ms. Van der Rohe had trained in the craft of drawing, of drawing at, uh, buildings, and he was doing 
and he was making a lot of money doing uh, middle class homes, aristocrats homes in, in Berlin and around Berlin uh, in, the, in the late teens and he was charging a mint and they were all neoclassical, mm -hmm. white marble, colonnades, atrium spaces, etc. Okay, not like we do here in Coral Gables, you know, I mean, it was a different brand, but that's what he was doing. They, the clients would pay to have a full scale model built on the side with wooden canvas just to see what their house would. And Mies one morning in 1919 woke 